brought to you by Form Systems, the leader in API and cloud gateway technology. Hi, I'm Greg Lamp. I'm the, one of the co-founders of Y Hat, and I'm here today to talk about some of the challenges that are associated with building data-driven applications. Oops. Oops. So I'll give you a brief intro just to who I am, what Y Hat does. I'll launch into some of the problems that are frequently occurring uh, in data science and actually trying to take some of the more academic or analytical data science work and turn that into products that can create value, look at some of the potential solutions that companies are using today. And then I'll launch into a case study building a recommender system using Python and Y Hat. And then finally, I'll give you a quick little demo and take any questions that you all might have. Uh, so first off, I'm the CTO of Y Hat. Uh, y Hat was founded uh, about a year and a half ago. We're headquartered in New York City. Venture backed, raised a seed round uh, a little over a year ago. And you might have heard us, we have a pretty popular data science blog. We have a few open source packages, uh, ggplot for Python, if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, we recently launched a new package called db.py. If you uh, haven't seen it, I recommend you check it out. So on the more commercial side, we have two products. One is called ScienceBox. ScienceBox is a, think of it as like a development environment or a, an analytical environment that's geared for actually helping you do your data science work. It comes with APIs and a command line client uh, that makes doing your work a lot easier. And then our second product is called ScienceOps, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And ScienceOps helps you build data-driven products. Okay, so we're all here at the Predictive API conference. I'm guessing you've all are pretty familiar with data science, why it's gotten so popular. You see, you know, big data was basically nowhere until 2012, when all of a sudden every CEO in America and the rest, and the rest of the world had to start saving all of their data. And now it's everywhere, you see it in time, my grandma is asking me about it, it's, it's everywhere. But what no one really thought about, at least at the higher level, was like, how do you actually get value out of your data? And so what happened is like a lot of people who might not necessarily have been qualified to be attempting to extract value out of these massive data sets, got bogged down with a lot of these projects that didn't go anywhere. And so, you know, companies looked at, okay, well, how can we solve this problem? How can we actually extract value out of our, out of all this data that we've been collecting? And that sort of enters this mythical data scientist, this man or woman that has all of these different skills. They're, you know, a statistician, they know machine learning, they know like production application programming, databases, scripting languages, like they're all over the place. And this is great. I wish there were more people like this, but unfortunately, this is sort of a unicorn. Like this person doesn't really exist. And so what I've seen happen is there are more people who kind of have the necessary skills to kind of make strategic insights. And I would think of that as something where, you know, you can run some SQL scripts, throw that into Excel or R, and do some basic sort of analysis where you're looking back in the past and you're able to tell your company and communicate to your boss how your company did, you know, in Q1 of this year. Versus sort of this new wave of thinking where, you know, data science isn't just this academic uh, approach to looking at the past, but you can actually use analytical methods to predict the future and to build data-driven applications. And so that's where there's really a lack of um, lack of skills and, and kind of this this bald spot in a lot of companies. Uh, so what makes this challenging? Well. Starts you off with just like a brief little kind of scenario. So take, say for instance, uh, we've got this guy Trey. Trey's a data scientist. He works at 
an e-commerce retailer, and he's pretty much a one-man show. Say his boss comes in one day, he's like, hey, Trey, we need to reduce churn on our site. We're getting crushed by our competitors. And Trey's like, all right, I'll, I'll go take a look at it. And he goes back to his desk, and he works on this project for a couple weeks, maybe a month. He's writing some SQL scripts, doing some you know, data cleansing in R, Python, and maybe some, some modeling. And what he comes back with is like this really cool uh, classifier that's going like, to transform the data into this vector space and then like be able to predict whether or not one of the customers on their site's gonna gonna churn. So his boss is like, that's great. Like that sounds good. Let's uh, let's make it happen. And so that next step of going from we have this really cool model that's you know we can use to actively assign value to our customers to how do we actually turn that into something that we can do on our website is a very challenging problem. You have the data scientist on one hand, you've got Trey, who's really good at writing analytical code, whether it's Python or R. You've got the engineering team, who's great at building web applications. They might use Ruby on Rails or .NET or whatever. And even though everyone's writing code, nobody really speaks the same language, and it's very difficult to kind of bridge the gap between the two parties. And so you're left with this situation where it's kind of like, well, you know, now what do we do? Like, we've got Trey over here, we've got the engineering team over here, and nobody really knows what the next step is. So there's a few options that are fairly common in industry today. See them uh, fairly regularly. The most common approach to solving this problem is to just translate your code. And what I mean by this is I write a model in Python. My company uh, uses Ruby on Rails for web applications, and I, as the statistician or the data scientist, would then rewrite whatever model I had built in Ruby. And that's really not a great way to go about it. It's extremely time-consuming. I've, As someone who had this as one of my previous jobs, it's incredibly boring. And you're really just rewriting things that some very, very accomplished individuals, a lot of times with like PhDs, have done already. And it's not fun. It leads to a lot of errors. Things like, you know, oh, I'm in Python, and decimals go to 16 digits, but in Java they go to 32. Things like that can uh, cause a lot of problems. Kind of reminds me of some movie titles. I've been in Barcelona for a couple days. I've seen some funny ones on uh, the subway signs, but, you know, Bad Boys 2, Dos Policias Rebeldes, Dos doesn't really seem to capture kind of the spirit of at least how I think of it in English. Second option is PMML. Uh, PMML, if you haven't heard of it, is a markup language for predictive models. So it's sort of like XML. Uh, it works with a few packages in R and Python. And when it works, it works pretty well. The problem is it's not supported across every single library. And it's kind of verbose. You can wind up with these like thousand line files of XML that are really challenging to debug. And then in addition, you know, what happens when you actually need to write helper functions or uh, need to write code for cleansing your data or doing data transformations? You wind up having to rewrite your Python or your R or whatever it is into PMML. And that's really you're back at the same uh, step one, which is you're translating uh, your code. Third common approach is batch jobs. This is just kind of my catch-all term for any you know, spaghetti code nightmare that lives on one person's computer. It's like this SQL script that like writes to a CSV that gets read into R, and then that like goes into S3 or Amazon somewhere. And it's this chain together mess. There's really only one person that knows how it works. If that person goes on vacation, your inbox might look something like this, where you've got like a thousand cron jobs that are emailing you, telling you that things are going haywire. It's not a very, not a very sustainable way, uh, not, a very, not a good approach, and I um, just don't recommend it. 
Okay, so the fourth magical option is, of course, to use Y hat. So Y hat is this glue between your analytical code and your production web application code. It's built uh, with a few tenants in mind. The first is that we think it's really important that you should be able to use the tools that you want. So if you like to use scikit-learn or you like you know, some of the more, uh, some of the R packages that are hyper-specific and you know, recently published in papers, you should be able to use those tools. Uh, your sort of deployment or your, um, the way that you monetize your work should not depend on uh, your tool selection. Secondly, you, know, you should be able to iterate and move quickly. So if you have one version of a model or one version of your analysis, and you want to maybe test out something new, uh, the cost of actually performing that test or you know, trying something new should be very, very low, and it should have a very, very quick cycle time. Uh, additionally, like sort of similar to being able to use whatever tools you want, you should also be able to use whatever workflow you want. So, for instance, like I don't really like the IPython notebook. I have a lot of peers that do. I think you know that shouldn't be an issue with how you actually uh, productize your work. So, you know, if you want to use the terminal, if you want to use the notebook, our studio, our Markdown, it should all be fine with this. And then lastly. Absolutely no translating. I really don't like translating code. It probably stems from the fact that one time I was given a 120-page PDF and told to translate it into Java, and it was not very fun. Okay, so sort of outline the problem. I uh, want to dig into a more tangible case study on what I'm actually talking about. So today we're going to be building... Think of it as a Pandora for beer. So we're going to be building this beer recommender that will allow me to uh, say what beers I like, and then the recommender will suggest some other beers that I should also try. Give you a quick little preview. Simple idea here. Uh, there's a little input wizard. I should be able to come in here and tell it a few beers that I, I like. In Budweiser. And then when I hit this go button, the application should deliver back some results as to uh, some other beers that I should probably try. So how do we actually build this? In order to build a recommender, we need some data. So the data set that we're using today comes from the Stanford Machine Learning Repository. It's uh, Originally from beeradvocate.com, it consists of about a million and a half beer reviews from around 30,000 users, 60,000 different types of beer. It's a pretty standard review website. You've got sort of this Yelp-like page where there's a score for how good each beer is according to Beer Advocate. It's that little 91 there. And then there's also a review from the, the bros. That was kind of funny. But the bros are what we're actually interested in. And those are the individual reviews. So review looks like this. I'm sure you've seen something like this before. You've got this username, which is extremely important. Remember that for later. Uh, we've got these actual quantitative metrics that uh, you know, describe the look, smell, taste, you know, all these different things about the beer. We're just going to be looking at the overall score for this exercise. I found that they were really all extremely correlated, and it didn't really make a difference uh, if you chose one of the more granular metrics as opposed to just using the overall score. And then um, lastly, like there's a bunch of text. I'm sure you could do some really cool text analysis on the reviews, but that's sort of outside the scope of this talk. So save that one for later. Okay, so... Reading in the data set, I'm going to be using Python and Pandas. Uh, data set looks something like this. Pretty straightforward. You've got the name of your brewery. You've got when the review occurred, the different ratings that people gave the beer, and then the username of each individual along with the beer name. I'm going to do a little bit of munging here, and what I'm really just trying to do is get the data set into a nicer format so that I have um, my user base, or excuse me, I have my beers in each row of this matrix. 
I have the each username in a column, and then you can think of it as sort of like a, a grid or like a lookup where you've got the ratings that correspond uh, to each user and beer pair um, in the cells. So I've got this matrix. What I need to do is come up with some sort of distance, distance metric for actually being able to compare beer one to beer two and beer, you know, and so on and so forth. So just as a quick example, I'm going to use Dale's Pale Ale and Bat Tire Amber Ale. If you haven't heard of these, don't worry about it. They're both beers. They're both from America. Uh, they're both kind of hoppy. They're, they're really similar. And so the idea is that I want to be able to quantify how similar Fat Tire reviews are to Dale's Pale Ale reviews. So if you think about this as sort of this, this grid or this coordinate space, I'm going to plot uh, reviews for the, the rating that each user gave Fat Tire on the X and the rating that each user gave Dale's on the Y. So you can think of this as Hank Mardukas gave Fat Tire a 1 and Dale's Pale Ale a 3.5. And so if you do this for every single user, it looks something like this. I've added a little bit of randomness to the data just so you can see the points a little bit clearer. Um, but you can start to see that there's sort of this general trend where ratings are clustering around that sort of four, four line. And that blue line represents uh, users that reviewed both beers the exact same. And that's what we're really looking for. We, we want to find this common set of users where everyone reviewed both Fat Tire and Dale's Pale Ale, and they both gave them a fairly similar review. And so if you kind of aggregate this up, you can see that uh, with the points being, the size of the points being how many people are kind of clustered in that area, uh, you've got that sort of general consensus right around that blue center line or that line of agreement, and it's also kind of around that four, three and a half mark. And so as a result, we're going to say that these two beers are fairly similar. As a counterexample, we're going to look at Fat Tire and Michelob Ultra. If you don't know what Michelob Ultra is, it's pretty much the closest thing to water that can still be classified as beer. So same looking chart here, except what do you know? The Fat Tire reviews are all really good. Michelob Ultra, basically nothing goes above three. And you've got this cluster of points sort of in the bottom right here. And that skew is, is going to represent uh, two beers that are not very similar. OK, so we're going to use those points to create uh, vectors. And now we need a way to actually calculate OK, so we have people that reviewed you know, Fat Tire and Dale's. How do we actually turn that into a single number that we can then use to make recommendations? There's a lot of different ways you can do this. Uh, there's a, many different, different distance metrics, Manhattan distance, uh, you know, Euclidean distance. For this exercise, I chose cosine similarity, really not for any particular reason other than I did some tests and it, it was working. Uh, I'm sure you could probably find a, a better way to do it, but it was just kind of a, a good base case to start with. And the great part about working with libraries in Python, in particular uh, Scikit-Learn, is that they've done a really good job of making everything super interchangeable. So if you do want to switch from cosine similarity to Euclidean distance, it's a one-line uh, code change. So you can see here, calculating the distance matrix from, um, from that beers and users matrix that I showed you earlier. And it looks like something like this, which I'm sure none of you can read, but that's OK. I don't really mean for you to. You have this giant matrix with beers in rows, beers in columns, and then the actual similarity score for uh, each cell corresponds to sort of that, that lookup chart. And what's a lot easier to see, at least in some capacity, is um, sort of this visualization of 
of, of each beer projected into a two-dimensional space. So I used uh, randomized principal component analysis to um, change that distance matrix into a 2D thing that we can actually plot and start to see some of the uh, groups that are emerging. And so you squint really hard, you, or you can just take my word for it. You see these groups like Sam Adams, for whatever reason, like all the Sam Adams beers are kind of clustered together. There's like this weird group of, I don't know, generic Western European beers that sort of are all on the left. And then in the bottom left here, there's kind of this, this cluster of American beers, and they're all really cheap American beers. And at the center of it all is Pabst Blue Ribbon, which, if you don't know, it's like the quintessential dirt cheap American beer. So we've got these groups that are emerging. It's, it's nothing like scientific, but just my gut instinct is telling me that, like, yeah, like, this makes sense. Like, if I showed this to someone who, you know, didn't know anything about scikit-learn or, or data science, they would probably say that, yeah, like, PBR is kind of similar to Miller Lite and whatever the case may be. Okay, so we've got this, we've got this distance matrix. Now we need to turn it into something that we can actually use to generate a score. So the idea being... Um, I would want to go into that application that I showed you earlier, specify a few different beers that I like, and then based off of that profile that I've given you, we want to be able to recommend uh, a new set of beers. So, super simple. I'm going to filter my distance matrix by the beers that I inputted. We're going to keep every single row in the data set, but we're going to limit the columns to just the, uh, the beers that I've indicated. We're then going to aggregate the columns across each beer. So it's nothing really like super scientific. We're just going to come up with this sort of aggregate composite score that we can then use uh, to rank order all of our beers. So now we've got this list from 1 to N with um, every single beer and the, how similar it is to the taste profile that I've specified. Of course, if I had told you that I like Sierra Nevada, that's not a super helpful recommendation. So we're going to eliminate any beers that uh, we might have included in the taste profile. And then lastly, of course, we need to give back some results. So all this gets uh, bundled into you know, 10 or 12 lines of Python. It's pretty simple. I have a link to the GitHub repository with all the data and all the code in it. So if you're interested in that, I'll uh, show you that later. Okay, so we've got this distance matrix. We've got a way to score or calculate recommendations for people. Last step was we need a way to deploy this and hook up this model into the web application that I showed you earlier. So to do that, we're going to be using Y Hat and in particular the REST API. Uh, REST API, it's super simple. It's just a basic JSON endpoint. You can post data uh, to that endpoint, and you'll get results back from uh, whatever code that you specify. So in our case, what this means is we're going to import the Y Hat Python module. Just super simple. You just do pip install Y Hat, and you're good to go. You're going to create a class that inherits from Y Hat model. For us, we'll just call it beer rack, something super simple. Uh, this is all. This is is just a kind of a scaffolding or a blueprint for uh, how we define our code and how we define what code is going to be executing when a API call is made. So within the, the within the class, we'll define a function called execute, which takes some incoming data from uh, an API request. In our case, this is going to be those. Th that list of beers or that, that sequence of beers that are specified in the form on the, the web application. I'm going to call that function, that get similar function that I showed you guys earlier. And when that executes, it'll generate that list of, of recommendations. And I'm going to format that just so that it's nice and neat and ready for uh, a JSON outpoint or JavaScript application. So I've defined that 
that model. Next and the last step is to deploy it. It's one line of code. You give your model a name, you tell it which Y hat model class you're using, and then um, you can you specify uh, the environment in which your uh, your code is running in. For us, that's just globals, or that's your global Python environment. Really, all that does is it lets us look through your source code. It'll detect any dependencies, whether that's libraries, whether that's data, whether that's helper functions that you may have written. It's going to serialize and uh, bundle up all that code, and then it's going to send it to a Y hat server where it'll be deployed as a REST API. Uh, so the admin application here, it looks something like this. You'll have you know, a pretty standard interface that just shows you uh, some metadata about your model, when it was last deployed, um, how you go about calling it, all that good stuff. Okay. So if we launch back into our demo here, I can now hit go on my application, and you can see that it's going to spit back some results as to some other beers that I might like. You want to take a look at the raw JSON endpoint or the raw response we're getting from the API. It's the same thing that I defined in uh, the class that I showed you. And then if you want to actually take a look at what it looks like in the UI, we can click on beer model. Uh, there's some utilities in here for just managing versions of models, staging versus production. Uh, how to call your model from the command line, web sockets, some sample input and output. I can come in here and maybe I'll change this to uh, Budweiser. You can run your uh, run your model in real time just to see how it actually works. Won't get into too much of this. If you're interested. Uh, there's a sandbox environment that you can sign up for on our website. Just visit yhq.com. Okay, so if you're interested in the code, whether for um, R or for Python, we have source code available on our GitHub page. It's github.com, yhat, and then um, yhat examples. There's also some code for the web application that I demoed, and I'll post these slides uh, just after this, so be able to access this. If you're interested in working on you know, predictive APIs or other sorts of data science applications, come find me afterwards. We're looking to hire people. And lastly, thanks to uh, Pappas and um, the organizers for putting on the event. Appreciate the invite. Brought to you by Form Systems, the leader in API and cloud gateway technology.